group. So I found that could actually make a difference. And that's why I sit here. So that's my spiel. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so I got here a little bit early and Stacey was here and we started talking about recapturing the fourth estate and basically building new models for journalism and so forth, which is uh, on Stacey's mind. Um, and this is the build OGM call for Tuesday, July 13th, 2021. Um, and so, so, um, so this kind of a mix of of how do we how do we stop drawing money out of the bottom of the pyramid uh, to fund all these kinds of things, and you know, get how do we get funding opportunities from from higher up the food chain? I don't know how to say it. You know, the 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 the, the pyramid, the food chain, the whatever. Uh, and then how do we revive um, journalism? I guess. Uh, because we need sort of live people who are doing this. Um, want to say more? Yeah, because the slight difference that I want to look at is what about if instead of looking to how do we get funding for this, we look at how do we get to a place that we're not looking for funding from above? So that's why when I talked about um, like gathering those people that are starting their platforms and having them buy into wanting to do this, because what we would be offering, first of all, would be community. So that would be a reason to at least want to have them stick their own foot in the water and provide us with content. What OGM could be doing is helping to organize that contact. And that's going to create a structure where people are going to meet each other. Mm -hmm. Once you got to that level, you have all these writers, all these videographers, all these people that are trying to teach you how to get your project started. And that's what we can teach the community so that we're teaching people how to actually use their ideas. But OGM is the core that creates that expertise. Right. And then that's something that the larger players, they have to pay to come in. So, so charge the larger players for access to the medium. Because I think making a living is really important to all the people you're talking about, including, including myself. Um, and I've, I, long ago, I, I said, like, if we built a Trident submarine three feet shorter, we could fund journalism in this country for a really long time. You know, the, 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 the amounts of money we spend on stuff, on stuff, I hope we never need. is crazy. Uh, yeah. Pete's mentioning something that Vincent has put in front of us, uh, in a couple of conversations in the chat, in, in the zoom chat here, uh, which we might want to switch over to the, to the mattermost, but, um, but the idea of curation that can be rewarded through token uh, through tokens in the economy, uh, there's a couple of different models. And then, and then there have been dozens upon dozens of efforts to rethink the economics of journalism, the mechanics of journalism, the, the platforms of journalism, all those kinds of things. I'm not sure any of them have actually succeeded yet. Um, I'd be interested in anybody's opinion on the call about what has worked and what hasn't. Go ahead, Stacey. The last thing I'm saying, I see this as more than just journalism. That's one arm of it, and I'm only sharing one part of the project, but it's also entertainment. And like, like I'm thinking, like if we took the energy that goes into video games and we redirected that energy into this, like we talked about the creating the news, almost like a scavenger hunt of finding events. That's the game part of it that, that would draw certain people into it. What I'm really talking about is creating a whole network. But the, the, the reason that somebody would want to join and add their content is because that makes them an investor. That's their price of it. They're like investing in this thing that we're going to try to create that covers more than just journalism. It covers all kinds of media creation. And the community is built in. Mm -hmm. I'm done now. I think I That's said right. everything. Dr. And I've had conversations with Phil, so he might be able to fill in where some of my ideas I didn't put out. Yeah, let me let me just try and find my notes here, and also, but I see. Sorry, Pete has his hand up as well. Yeah, Dr. Kaminsky. Um, I think it's a great idea, Stacey. I think. Um, for, for what it's worth, as I work within OGM and Kika Lab and the, the general Plex that we're in, um, that's basically the, you know, the question, the, the question I'm working on. Um, uh, why don't we make, so for me, 
um, one component of that is that uh, we have little sovereigns, um, very small organizations that are focused on, uh, for me, it's software development or um, information management or things like that, right? But that's where you see CSC is a place that people come to, to communicate and collaborate. Um, uh, Massive Wiki is a place where people not only kind of, it, it's not only that the peer production is kind of owned or something like that. It's like Massive Wiki is actually the idea that, um, that, that it's not, collectively own it's it's uh, or it's not uh, you don't push information towards the middle you push information around all over the place all over people right and um, the information exists in communities a lot of massive wiki is the idea that um, that uh, information happens in community with other people and ideally small groups of people in lots of overlapping and decentralized ways so the the it's it's for me it's the same you know that there's a continuum between software development information management uh entertainment uh news mm -hmm. all of that stuff for me is the same and i think you're totally right that we want to decentralize it and figure out how how we replace big these big massive structures with the same kind of energy and passion and um in, investment from ourselves uh into you know, into the world um, with, uh, so we don't want to do that in big centralized columns. We want to do that in very broad distributed, distributed ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put my hand down a sec. Um, and also one of the goals here has been to create a shared asset, uh, informational asset, Indra's net, you know, to use an old uh, analogy. Uh, that is useful for education, for journalism, for science, for everybody, so that when students grow up and, and make it better, they're making better data sets and information and, and relationships and arguments that are used by journalists that put out there. And when journalists write an important piece about something, those elements of their piece are actually in this shared space. Uh, so that someone could go, you know, if there's a brilliant article that, that somebody wrote that's changing policy ideas about it, then that then the argument parts of it in the middle and the evidence that supports the argument are available for others to pick up and use and improve on. Um, and so at some point, a, a politician might be drawing on exactly the same pieces of the web uh, of Indra's net that we've got between us uh, and showing it in a debate and saying, uh, you know, this thing over here, yes, and here's what it looks like as policy instrumentation. And then somebody else, scientists, could be measuring the effects of that policy in the same webs uh, uh, of information that we're using. So for, for me, I'm like, I've often wondered why we aren't all trying to improve the soil. So I, there's a piece I want to write called Data is the New, is the new Soil, because a couple of years ago, there were a bunch of articles, Data is the New Oil, and their intention was, we're just going to capture everybody's data and sell it off and look how valuable it is. And you know, basically dumpster diving on everybody is, is such a such a great idea. We just want to, it's going to be the basis of the new economy. And I'm like, uh, how about data is the new soil? I'm thinking about soil fertility um, as a way of building this up. Then there's this separate issue of how do you charge for it? Who gets who gets to pay for it? And who can make a living from doing the, the, the tilling of that, of that uh, virtual soil, which is a, a big issue, but really, really complicated in the middle here. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, just sorry, just reviewing my notes from speaking with Stacey and I had a couple of really great conversations. Um, and the initial conversation kind of centered around that we're trying to make this major shift from our current system, but none of us, but basically we're, we're trying to build a new system, but our products of the existing system. So how to create kind of a space that brings in, she used the word muggles. She said, you guys had talked about okay. the term muggles and how we bring in muggles as part of this process, people that aren't part of this system thinking group. Um, she also um, made reference to um, Gill's um, re, I forget what the proper term is, but re, basically restructuring capitalism um, and looking at kind of land as cyberspace, labor as creatives, capital as attention and figuring out how we kind of introduce this new economy. Um, but the overlying goal was to create a, a learning library garden and kind of change the education process, which Jerry, I think is something you're very interested in well and just kind of trying to reteach people. Um, the other part of it was 
working on different kind of little groups. Like if it's deciding there's 10 projects we want to work on or 10 people we want to focus on and figuring out what kind of working groups we need to create short videos or create a TV show or a channel or a network around these topics and ideas and kind of bringing in the academics, the creatives and, and creating this new kind of collaborative um, future. Yeah, that's, I think I correct. If there's anything I'm missing. Thank there, you. That, that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Judy and Doug, welcome to the call. We, we, we started off heading into recapturing the fourth estate, rethinking journalism and the, the, the economics of journalism, the intentions, you know, all of those kinds of things. And that, that's where we've been uh, dwelling for the first few minutes of the call. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Judy, I assume you're breakfasting. I am. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's uh, step back for just a second, and I just want I just want to um, sort of check in in some sense uh, because all of us I, I think the conversation we were just having shows that like at least for me uh, we're just thinking really hard about all the issues around this and how to how to pool them together how to make them better where are the points of leverage uh, what can we affect uh, what experiments can we run and so forth and and Stacy um, we're not very separated from a bunch of journalism institutions and projects. I mean, uh, you know, Craig Newmark funds a whole bunch of, a bunch of journalism. He's a major funder now for the Columbia Journalism School and a bunch of others. Um, Craig Newmark is on the list of people for me to try to pitch to fund OGM projects in some sense. And so if, you know, if we could frame, and, and a piece of the conversation I was hoping to have today is about how do we see projects? Like what's a project? What's our list of projects? And how do we see those? And how do, how do we take them from glimmer of a spark of an idea in somebody's head to listing someplace to OKRs, objectives and key results that we can kind of measure over time and offer up as a way of tracking our, our efforts on all this. Um, so that's, that's uh, sort of a thought. But um, actually, by, mean, by, way, by way of checking in for a second, I just want to say I, I, I was in Fresno for a memorial service over the weekend. It was hotter than Hades in Fresno. Luckily, air conditioning appears to be a popular device uh, there. Uh, but on, on walking to the little airplane that took me back to Portland on Sunday was the peak of the heat, all matched the peak of the heat on the weekend. And it was 112 on the tarmac. And it was just, I felt like I was standing in an air fryer again, sort of, we had that we had the, the heat dome in Portland a while ago. But strangely, in the middle of my trip, I had three really long, really great calls that have a lot to do with OGM. The first one was with Nova Spivak, uh, who is an entrepreneur and like, uh, there's an ARC project that um, in the, when, when, um, when Elon Musk sent the Tesla car up into space, heading out into space at the launch of the Falcon Heavy or whatever it was, that masterful picture of like a dummy sitting at the wheel saying, with, uh, with the little dashboard saying something like, don't panic or thanks so long and thanks for all the fish. I forgot what the quote was, but, but that, that masterful picture of like, this is how you do space travel. In the trunk of that, of that Tesla was a copy of the ARC, which is uh, one of Nova's many projects. And the ARC is meant to be the new version of what is, this, what is the CD-ROM that contains samples of civilization? Like how do we explain ourselves to a different culture? And so, uh, so that's one of his projects. And I had called him to sort of pick his brain a, a bit about how to pitch OGM, what to do. And he had a bunch of interesting uh, 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 topics, one of which was uh, maybe we should put a copy of the brain on the next version of the ARC. That, came, that showed up for him after our call. He sent me this note saying, uh, Jerry, why don't, why don't we put a copy of the brain in the ARC? And I'm just realizing that I have an open loop with him to explain why it's 500 megabytes big. So if we can bookmark that, uh, I need to get back to him, like what's with the size of it? Anyway, um, so the Nova conversation went in lots of different directions, including some more esoteric ones but I'll, that, I, that I won't come back to right now. Then I talked to Se Sebastian Hassinger, who is an old, old friend, and we had no intention of talking about OGM, but he is with IBM right now, um, working on stuff that is incredibly OGM-y. And we realized, oh, okay, this is totally resonant. We had a great and fruitful conversation uh, that took us in lots of different directions. I'll, I'll reconsult my notes here, but uh, he's going to set up a meeting between me and his boss and see if we can't kind of uh, find some, some forms of overlap in what we're doing and what they're doing, uh, which was really great. And then Sunday morning, I had a conversation with Pat Scannell, Scannell 
um, who I know because we're both on uh, a mailing list that Gordon Cook started years ago, uh, who, uh, who was kind of a, a, a really nice geek reporter for the telecom sector. And we just went way deep and he's, he, he offered up a metaphor or in that conversation, we came into a metaphor that, uh, uh, that worked really well that I offered up in a call yesterday, the call that, that Jordan ran, uh, which stuck, uh, which was of quilting. <clears throat> And basically that, um, and I've, I've been searching really hard for metaphors for OGM in the sense of, you know, are we like a barn raising? Are we like, a, you know, ant, a leaf cutter ants? Uh, are we like a, a glass uh, specialist, the glass, the stained glass craftsman who, who welds together the various pieces of, the, of, the, of colored art, which make up the rose window? Mm. And, and uh, on Sunday, I was like, well, it's kind of like we're all in a quilting bee and we're making a patchwork quilt because the pieces individually are beautiful, but they're woven together in a way that makes the whole artwork really beautiful. Uh, the, the making of that work is called a quilting bee. It's a communal effort. Uh, the fabric and the texture of the quilt really works. And also uh, quilting and weaving are, are really ancient arts. Uh, but they're not durable arts uh, because fabric rots. And so they don't get as much fame as ziggurats and other monuments, mostly to like male rulers who are trying to make themselves uh, immortal. Um, anyway, but, but this notion that, that um, we were kind of trying to help, uh, uh, help create sort of a quilt that could nurture like all of us was, is interesting and uh, formed an interesting kind of uh, background. But, but, but then Pat and I talked about a bunch of other things that were very OGM-y. So, so those three conversations have been like spinning in my head. I need to go back and consult my notes and, and report on them better. But I just wanted to bring, bring them into our conversations here because they were really helpful in helping me see like what our possibilities are and where to go. Um, so let me just stop. That was a little longer check than I thought, but anybody else want to jump in? Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I missed the call, Jerry. I had a couple of things come up here that precluded attending. So I hope it might have been recorded. Um, I, should I check with Jordan on that? Probably. Is it, this is yesterday's call. It was definitely recorded. They even recorded all the breakouts. So I'm pretty sure they'll have a good uh, catch up. Okay, perfect. Sorry that I couldn't constructively contribute. Um, it's all right. We but, missed you. <laughs> um, I, I think. An important dimension of this that I keep coming back to is the process side of it, the sort of human interaction side and how we make available to various groups and individuals uh, ways to come together and tools, not just the, the tools, but the social dynamic processes that will help them be effective working together. And that is can be enabled and fostered by the right technology support to that type of interaction. Um, breakout rooms are an example of how Zoom has adapted to that need for smaller group discussions. But I also think that there's a, a deeper level of the process of building communities and communication processes and shared objectives and shared planning that allows groups or teams of individuals to move toward a goal together. And that involves, as we talked about before, metrics and measures that are not so much stakes in the ground, although they are, but better ways of telling if you're making progress or if you need to change direction or if you need to modify what it is that you're trying to do. And so I think that's a sort of social science piece that I still think we need to spend some time framing and thinking about how we might have groups of individuals who are good at that sort of thing, helping frame that and available to groups so that the groups become more effective. And that applies to both in-person groups as well as virtual groups. Absolutely. And, and Judy, one of the projects that I envision framing up and describing eventually as a set of OGRs and project plans, for Pete, and Pete, I'm really interested in the blending of your project plans idea with OKRs, like what's the bridge there? And then how do we see all of that in several different dashboards, like at, at different levels of granularity? Um, but one of the projects that I'm eager to frame up and see if anybody's interested in is um, how do we instrument the beautiful bodies of pattern languages like liberating structures, pure wise democracy, pattern language, and there's others. How do we instrument those so that they're easily at hand for anybody who wants to level up their game, 
Can we front end them with some kind of a chat bot or individuals with judgment who are available for quick questions for what process should, like my group is stuck. We're trying to do this kind of thing with this many people. What process do you, do you suggest or something like that? And it's like, oh, try World Cafe. What's World Cafe? Boop, here's World Cafe. Oh, I'd love to run that. Boop, step one, step two, you know, gather these materials, uh, go through this step. You know, I'm not sure, I, I'm, not sure I'm smart enough to, to run this thing or experienced enough. Uh, can I hire somebody who could run it for me? Boop, here's a, here's a marketplace of people who have the skill uh, to run you through this process. So I'm, 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 I think that's like probably three different kinds of projects mixed together, but I think they illustrate um, a way that OGM can actually participate and aim at things that are missing, build out some of them in a skinniest, you know, toothpicks and, and, and tape kind of form, uh, just frame them up and then put them in the world in a way to see like, okay, what does that create? And, and if that doesn't resonate with what you were just saying, and I'm heading off in a different direction, uh, say so, because that, I'm, I'm thinking that that's kind of a manifestation of, of also what you're saying. No, I, I agree with all of that, Jerry, but while I think of it, because Stacy kind of triggered it with some of her comments about um, papers and positions of people and so forth, I wonder if we could tuck in the background somewhere, um, framing the equivalent of the Locke and Demosthenes debates from Ender's Game, where wise people posed as individuals who debated major topics in the public as a way to represent how the topics twingle together, which is the biggest issue I see us facing in this country right now is that we're so polarized, the groups never talk to each other. And there's really no forum where the topics are discussed together appropriately. But in Ender's Game, the two siblings, um, I guess it was Peter and Valentine who took on pseudonyms of Demosthenes and Locke, um, wrote a whole series of presumably basically internet-based debates that framed the polarization of key issues and allowed the healthy debate of those viewpoints with respect so that the viewers and other wise people might pull out of that the central wisdom that could be balancing. And I see that so lacking right now. It's like you either watch you know, Fox News or you read the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And not, none of the people except weirdos like me do both because I wanna see different perspectives of the same question. And there used to be a publication which is probably still out there called Mother Earth News that pulled in writers from opposing viewpoints to put together tableaus of viewpoint. And I just think our group might be, while somewhat liberal probably in general thinking, would be the right group to try to pull that framing together and actually knit more rich conversation potential for many people. Um, and you've also just described a different set of scenarios that I would love to, to, to set up within OGM. And again, now I'm thinking project-wise, you know, what, what, what does testing what you just described look like uh, in, in its simplest form? That's a, a great thing. Well, if, if you're doing it like journalism or like news, it's viewership. I mean, how many people actually listen to the debate if it's a, a verbal debate or how many people, how many clicks do you get to this intertwingling of opposing viewpoints page by page? <laughs> yeah, we, we also have in our community a bunch of black belts in debate. So Canonical Debate Lab, uh, Jamie Joyce, <clears throat> a bunch of others have been thinking and working on this piece of it a lot. So one, one place where we're heavy, I think, is in people like really interested in the presentation of arguments and public debate and whether it's on forums or in some other visual form or something like that. I think we, we've got a lot of talent there, which we haven't picked up and done anything with. We haven't offered them uh, a place to, to you know, mix their ideas in or even, or even a show and tell in that sense. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Phil. Um. I love the idea, Judy. I'm also a huge fan of Ender's Game, so I love the reference. Um, one thing I'm kind of curious about is just to boil it down, are we talking about changing the way arguments are stated digitally? Or are we talking about changing the way people interact with information? Like if you had to boil down like 
if this was a project, if you had to boil it down to the very simplest thing that the project was focused on, is it how we present information? Is it how we discuss information? Um, I, I think it's both. I think in the simplest terms, it would be interesting to attempt to hold the equivalent of presidential debates, which arguably were, were not entirely successful in their current form, but identify key knowledge experts with differing viewpoints and invite them to present in a video live and be recorded with sort of, they state their case, handle it just like a debate. They state their case, then they respond to the questions of the opposition. Um, I mean, it would take some people more scholarly in this practice than I am, but I think for a lot of people who are confused or who have a genuine interest to understand why half the country thinks X when they think Y, it would be useful to find mechanisms for that to occur. Right now, the only thing you can really do is look for opposing opinions in newspapers or occasionally in magazines like The Atlantic or something like that, because they'll attempt to get some balanced viewpoint um, just in the interest of good journalism. And I'm thinking that with the literacy levels in this country, written word is not the way to reach the majority of the people. And in other cultures, it's even less the way. And so it's sort of like we need to go back to the days of the radio or the TV in the early days when people could take in the information without needing to read it because the literacy level in the country is like fifth or sixth grade. And these topics are more complex than fifth or sixth grade words. <laughs> Doesn't mean you use the big words, but you need to frame it in a bigger way. I'm not saying this real clearly because it's a pretty early formation idea. No, no, that, that's, that's hugely helpful. Um, yeah, in my mind, I think the video idea is fantastic. And then maybe we could do a quick hitter, like here's the key points, key takeaways for that kind of simplified the text to have some kind of text takeaway. But I, I agree that the video thing is the way to go. I think Stacey's project is, is resonates with that as well, that she's looking to create video content because it's kind of the most digestible. Um, and I, I apologize, I missed a little piece in the middle, but uh, Judy, you just reloaded a piece of the conversation yesterday with Pat in my, into my head, which I really liked. Um, and it, it came about in a kind of a strange way in that he said, oh, do you know John Brockman? And I'm like, well, yeah, I was kind of near, a near miss on his Digerati book, but he called me the pilgrim because I was thinking, you know, I was kind of going and reporting on different people in the tech business way back when. And then I remembered that I sat next to Mitch Ratcliffe at a conference long ago, and we were going to actually do a pilgrimage. We were going to each make a list of the people that we thought were like changing the world and go, go visit them and interview them in different ways. And that, that we just didn't do that. We, we shelved it. But then Pat and I started talking about OGM. One of the things that might make OGM really interesting and lively is to create kind of a pilgrimage path for it, where we go interview some of the thinkers that we're talking about. And in so doing, start to OGM the interviews, meaning, um, meaning uh, Max Marmer took the transcript of one of our early calls and mapped it into Miro boards uh, so that you could see the pattern of the conversation. Um, Kiko Lab has done a whole bunch of post-processing of things and trying to call, and even just a simple video edit. Pete has been using uh, the script basically to, to deconstruct and reconstruct uh, videos and so forth, which is also dangerous because it, it uses uh, Lyrebird to fake people's voices if it has a good voice sample. So you could in fact have people saying things that they didn't say, which is uh, like a deep fake. But, but, but we wouldn't have to just do one form of transform on the interviews. We could in fact, I, I would naturally be sitting there curating them into my brain or whatever the future brain platform is. And, and we could invite other people to do other kinds of riffs on the info so that there's this sort of gallery view of the emerging discussion. And if the people we go interview are not the usual suspect white men, then we actually increase the diversity of our thinking uh, of how it goes. And then another thought I had was, and for each thinker, we're not just trying to replicate everything that's in all of their books, which is interesting, but rather, um, hey, this sounds a lot like this other, you know, this sounds like this other sort of philosophy or philosopher. Can we blend those ideas together? Like, like I think, I think an interesting thing we can do in the world is kind of chew at the boundaries between 
uh, ways of seeing the world and possible solutions for the world to see if, they, if they're actually the same or actually different and, and also contrast those views so that we can say, hey, this is really opposite to this other sort of body of work. What's up with that? How do you see it? Uh, where do you go? And then as we learn from each of our visits, uh, we're basically refining the artifact, the Indra's net that sits between us uh, that lets us move forward. Go ahead, Stacey. I think in addition to everything you're saying, another thing that would be good is to go in as, not just on a pilgrimage, but as explorers, finding people that are already working in their communities that don't have a book, that haven't published a book, but have actually organized their communities and are doing things because a lot of people don't know how to get started. So these people are special in that, uh, you know, they didn't have the rich uncle or they didn't have, you know, the Ivy League education. And now they put out a book. They are the ones I think we need to start shifting a focus towards. And that's where we're going to find diversity. Um, and, and I just could, really quickly, G, uh, we could borrow the NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month is just a contest where people write a novel in the, in the month of November, I think, every year. Um, we could put up a contest like that for people who've got a book inside them and figure out how to how to get those books out. Sorry, Judy, go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention there was a novel that our book club read called News of the World. And the main character is a fellow on horseback who travels from town to town and reads the newspaper in the local pub to the people in town because the people in the more primitive world of the US at that time are not readers. And so he's bringing news to the town by presenting it to them orally. This predates, of course, in Old West days television, radio, and a bunch of other things. But it harks back to that in the role that this could play in presenting information. So you could have newscasters presenting, a panel of newscasters presenting different types of content rather than the people who are packed poles apart on the positions that are there. I think it, it invites a lot of creative thinking about different formats that might then lead to contemplation and reshaping of views. Mm -hmm. um, and that just reminds me of another piece of the conversation with Pat, which is the interviews with each of the people visited on the pilgrimage would themselves make a media channel. They, you know, they would easily be a, a Twitch TV or whatever that could just be a, you know, slightly edited would, would look like a podcast or whatever else. And that would be one artifact, right? But then, but then adding other artifacts in parallel to it and enriching the whole experience and making that easy to access would be a very visible way for us to experiment with, with sort of adding OGM to the world and building this out. I also think there's a sort of a psychology question of this that I'm not the right person to answer either, but how is it that we actually invite people to hear views that are opposing to their own because we're so affinity based in our approach to society? And that I think, you know, perhaps you can do it by having keynotes that are icons in the disparate points of view, each of whom will bring their followers, but their followers are coming to hear view B, not to be influenced by view A. And so the dynamic of actual reforming of ideology is a pretty complicated social cycle dimensional that I'd love to see us tackle because I don't see it getting tackled anywhere. Um, Phil? Yeah, I, I, I had a different point, but after hearing Judy say that, I, I do think even if you bring in two sides of the conversation, as, as Judy said, a lot of times it, the conversation or the chat kind of devolves into a tit for tat uh, kind of uh, conversation of kind of I don't know, it just usually it devolves into an unhealthy dialogue, basically. It's not, people aren't engaging with the conversation, they're fighting about their point or fighting for their point. So if we could, sorry. I was just gonna say that the phrase that suddenly popped in my head was common ground. Yeah. And if we could find a platform that allows creation of common ground or at least identification of common ground, that would be powerful. Yeah, and, and maybe if we have a, at the, the beginning, 10 minutes is, is kind of a, a masterclass in how to engage or how to, to talk about different topics or engage with opposing views. I think 
something along those lines could be helpful. My, my original question though was how we kind of stand this up and how we get this going. Um, and I guess the one strategy would be to decide, decide the topics we want to focus on uh, and search out uh, uh, experts that way or look at our own networks, what experts we know and see kind of where we have warm introductions that people we could probably talk to and then break those out into different topics or different areas. Um, but I, I would, I mean, I'll let Pico, but I would say like a simple air table where people can say experts they know with their expert, their subject topic area, and we can go from there and kind of start doing a bit of outreach. Thanks, Phil. I'm Pete. I want to say something, uh, well, um, I mean this gently. Um, uh, uh, OGM thinks a lot. Um, thinking is really good, but um, but there's something is to be said for the folks that say, "I have a project. Do you want to help join? You want to join my project? Uh, how can I make my project better? Um, I'm building this thing. I have a blog. I have a wiki. Can you join this discussion with me to work on my project?" Um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I, I like it when people are are doing their projects. Um, I also I can report out. Uh, by the way, the the call yesterday was interesting. Jerry and I were both on it. Um, one of the things that struck me, I was in the making uh, making communities more efficient or something like that. It was kind of the tools thing. Um, we're really far along OGM and, and the Plex around us, OGM and Flotilla and Kiko Lab um, uh, are far along the idea of how, how do we decentralize and how do we federate. Um, and I think that's the, the key of how we uh, decompose these big superstructures. So it was interesting hearing a bunch of smart people talk about, I was in a breakout on that. And um, Having, having them talk about, you know, how this is going to work, uh, having, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million people working on making the world a better place. Uh, and um, they still talk about there should be an organization that does. And instead of, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of organizations in a flotilla that are working together. So I, I feel really good about where we are. So I want to go back to your gentle nudge, uh, Pete, because uh, because I think so. The spirit in which I'm presenting the ideas with Pat yesterday that turned into this a pilgrimage that turned into sort of swarming ideas and reweaving them was that this could be a major project that shapes OGM and OGM's path into the future, and out of it would spill some of the some of the effects, some of the tools, some of the some of the other projects that we want to build uh, along the way, and. It could be that it's a dead end, and I'm sort of testing the waters with you all to see if it sounds exciting. And it seems to fit what Stacy was saying uh, at the start of our call. I think it sort of uh, fits in there pretty, pretty in, in pretty interesting ways as well. Um, and if it weren't exciting to other people who then wanted to come join the project and sub projects of doing this, then it would be a no, a no op. It would just not be interesting. But 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 that was entirely the spirit in which I was saying it, and I realized that. We've been through lots and lots of talking and lots and lots of, hey, what if we did this? And at this point, we aren't doing enough of anything. Um, but does that match? And I mean, are you trying to are you trying to gently say, hey, nice try with another idea, but why don't we just do a simple thing? Or are you like, could you be less gentle <laughs> and more, and more, can't be more direct much, with your less advice? Gentle. But, um, but take, for instance, this call. Um, uh, the conversations on this call, where will they end up? Um, I think they'll end up in a recording. I th and I think a few people will watch the recording and I think they'll fizzle out from there. Um, is, is that, you know, I, so I've, I've, one of the things I've been reflecting on for a few weeks, um, and this is part of a longer um, quest, you know, over the past six or nine months, um, how, do we, how do we know what we know? How do we remember? Um, how do we uh, have conversations that then turn into actions? Um, one of my observations kind of, it's a simple one, but obviously it feels deep and profound to me is that um, 
each of us, as we work together, each of us, or or there's there's a significant amount of overhead to kind of coordinating with other people. Um, uh, it's um, and it's a pain. It's a pain in the in the rear when you know uh, when somebody says, "Hey, can we take notes about this? Could we make a project plan for that?" You know, and it, it feels like we've we've been trained in our society that these these wonderful organizations magically make things happen for us, right? And other people do the work and we get used to that. So it's easy to, it's easy to say, well, I have this great idea and, you know, somebody should do this. Um, but the kind of the upshot, if, if we actually need, if we want traction on the ground, uh, it's a lot more like, hey, can we slow this conversation down? Can we take some notes? Can we make some plans? You know, get to the end of a meeting, say, okay, who's going to do what, when? Start doing things like, I have a project, you know. Uh, so one of the random little projects that popped up last week was Wendy McLean doing mapping. Um, she's uh, she's had the, the concept, the idea of visual mapping, uh, um, supercharging, you know, everything, uh, information, space projects and everything and she finally kind of last week got to the point where with a couple conversations she's like um i guess i have to do it <laughs> um and so she she pulled together a map uh in a software tool of the plex around her um and uh said here's an artifact and and it sucked in a lot of ways um it, she didn't send it to the right people it wasn't well named you know i and i'm not i'm not saying any of those things to be mean, I'm saying them actually to be kind of generative. Um, she did it, she did something. She ran it up the flagpole. And, and you know, because we're, because we need more of that, a bunch of people said, yay, that's awesome. Um, and nobody said, uh, you know, Wendy, this isn't finished or I wish you had done it better this way or, you know, so um, seeing that was a, a balm to my heart, you know, somebody just doing something and saying, here's a thing and not being embarrassed about saying, you know, it's not a perfect thing, it's a thing. And I want, I want to do it more and I want more help and, you know, what's wrong with it and let's go, let's do it. So more of that. Um, Phil and Doug, and I don't know in what order. Uh, I've spoken a lot, Doug can go ahead. Okay. Um... I find myself thinking that we keep talking about trying to help other groups have a conversation. Uh, why don't we do that with ourselves? Uh, point two is talking about projects uh, always makes me feel like when a project is being defined, part of the definition is it leaves out a lot of reality. <laughs> Often it leaves out the reality that's important to what the project is actually about. So uh, how to have a conversation that focuses on an issue, on, on the real issues that are on our minds, where we don't quite know what that is yet, especially in this group, where we tend to think we're fairly homogeneous, but I think we're very heterogeneous. If we start looking at what we think is going on in the world, a lot of vari variance is gonna open up here. And we're not handling that yet. And yet we're talking about helping other groups handle it. I'm mixed on that. How does anybody else feel? Uh, I feel like, well, go ahead. Uh, Phil and Pete? Uh, if Pete's responding to that, Pete, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Um, I kind of agree with Doug um, in the sense that we haven't deliberately filtered to certain viewpoints, but the character <laughs> of our interactions provides a subtle filter. And we end up with people in the room who think a lot of the same things we think and not always applying critical thinking. Someone will perhaps take an individual, you know, challenge a bit or something. But I think, I think that comment by Doug is important. I also think Pete's comment of welcoming the people who actually are ready to do something is critical because one of the things that we're very capable of is thinking about a lot of things, but reducing them to action <clears throat> that results in change or output um, is not collective usually, it's very individual. Pete, then Phil and me. Um, thanks, Doug. 
Um, I, I agree conversations are important. Um, and I also agree that it's easy for people to say, I'm doing something without uh, without really understanding what they're doing or who they're including or who, you know, what, what the, the, the aims and the goals are. I think, uh, so we have a place where we, where we have conversations. There are a lot of us in conversation uh, right now that's, it's centered around Mattermost. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be the only place. And there are other conversations that go on in, in other dimensions. Um, some of the conversations um, I guess we've, we've gotten to the point where we have clusters of people, small, small groups of people, uh, who have viewpoints and projects. Uh, so Trove, for instance, or Massive Wiki, for instance, um, where they're building something and they're building it with an opinion and a viewpoint. Um, so we have, we have, uh, first degree discussions where, uh, you know, we talk about massive wiki or something like that, and and actually, to be to be fair and honest, uh, a lot of the discussions, some of them happen in artifact space, um, uh, where other people can see them, and and still a lot of discussions happened uh, happen you know between people in Zoom rooms or or even worse in private conversations or something like that. Um, so a lot of what is happening with Massive Wiki you can't see unless uh, you happen to be on a call with me and Bill Anderson or me and Wendy Elford. Um, uh, but still, uh, even even with that, we have we have patterns of coming back. Vincent will post things about Trove. Here's what's going on with Trove, or or I I will post things. Here's what's going on with Massive Wiki. Um, so we have these first degree conversations, and those happen, you know, to some extent already. And I guess the the Mattermost channels act as a primordial soup, to use um, a metaphor I use sometimes. Um, the, the Mattermost conversations end up being a place where we can kind of see each other and get the idea of what, you know, people know what Bill is interested in and what Wendy's, Wendy Elford's interested in or what I'm interested in. And then you can have a, a, a more pointed conversation. I have a conversation later today with Mark Carranza. We've been playing scheduling dance for a few days, but he and I know kind of what we think <laughs> and that a, a more focused conversation privately not not because not because we want to keep it private, but because it's more manageable to have a, a close private conversation. Um, we're going to do that later today, and and something will, cool will come out of it. So there is within OGM and and the the communities around OGM, we do have this reasonably rich way to converse. Um, we also have second degree conversations where clusters of those, uh, so this is a flotilla, clusters of those people, um, Trove and Massive Wiki and Factor and Kika Lab come together in a forum space that is in between those groups. Um, and those are super generative, I think, because people come to those with a viewpoint and opinion and, and uh, the thing that we kind of evolved in flotilla was, a keen interest in interoperability. How can we do our own thing, but also meet in the middle and cross cross pollinate, uh, cross fertilize what we're doing? Um, so uh, that's been super generative, and I want to see more of that all over the place. Um, so that's that's kind of the communication and don't you know conversation stuff. It's it's actually happening now. Um, uh, it could be richer. It definitely could be more artifacty. Um, uh, video re YouTube recordings are 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 certainly artifacts, but they're not very accessible. Um, so, uh, so I guess I try to encourage people to. I it, it's hard. It's hard to make artifacts that are useful for other people and useful for yourself. But um, if you have a mix of meeting notes and recordings, then at least you've got a bit of a, a hack on it. Uh, taking our video recording and turning it into a transcript and turning it into highlights or something like that. That's a lot of work and it doesn't get done much because it's a lot of work. Um, by the way, just as it, it just popped in my head, OGM could do well just by funding some of that, you know, um, digesting uh, videos into small chunks. Um, uh, so then projects, project plans. Uh, the 
I, I carry a flag for, um, I've got a, a manifesto, uh, the, the name I have for it is everything is a project. Um, the OGM name is actually something more generic, even it's a project template or something like that. Uh, the, there is a way, and I do it wherever I go, to say, uh, okay, let's not just have some wild idea that we're chasing after without much thought or coordination. Let's actually write this up as a project plan. And, and for me, a project plan includes a conversation amongst the people who are doing it. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that, that we've been successful when we accomplish it? And what are, you know, what are we, how, how are we accomplishing it? What are our practices in um, keeping track of what we need to do, what we've done, um, whether we've done it the way we like it or not. So it's, when I say project, I don't mean, um, I, I guess none of us have been using the project template very well, even me. Um, but I'm also willing to share my project template or listen to other people with their project template. Um, it's, it's not hard to, to be effective um, in setting up goals, sharing the goals, discussing the goals long enough that you share them with the whole project team, um, uh, setting up roles where people know what they're doing in a project, and then we're moving forward, you know, on the on those goals. Uh, we've had some pressure from Lionsburg to to do better at that, and so OGM, uh, especially Judy and me and Jerry, went through that pretty deep. Um, we're we're focusing right now, uh, you know, the OKR thing uh, that uh, that Judy brought in, I think, and, and a few of us have picked up on um, is a way to sharpen our ability to continue to do project stuff. I guess, so it's it's interesting. I thought I, I was coming into this part of my response saying, um, oh, we do, you know, we're good. We know how to do projects. Um, we know how to do projects and we're doing a sucky job at it. I, I can own that. Um, none of our projects are have good published project plans um, and goals and and uh, visibility out to other projects and things like that so i will take it as an action item to do better for my projects to do that um, phil then me yeah um hey thank you for all that i i echo all that sentiment uh generally um one thing I've seen, and I know I haven't been in OGM as long as most people, but I do see that we have great conversations and we have conversations and we have conversations. And, and I think we've all seen that, that it just, it's just kind of these different conversations. One thing I'm trying to do, um, or we're trying to do is figure out what people do want to work on, break out those working groups, create those documents, those project plans. And then I think we can easily see where people are willing to work and maybe people that are talking about projects but won't work on them and then we can figure out what what ogm can support and fund out of those areas of interest i think we do want to take advantage of the people not take advantage but but support the people in our group that have that are experts in a space we want to bring people together that are doing things actually doing things and people who want to do things um so creating spaces for that and creating spaces for work because uh, most of our spaces right now are for conversation and just conversation, but how do we create those spaces where people are working and moving forward on different, um, different topics or different projects, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I think even with the conversation today, I was, I was trying to say like, let's create this air table and we can start, that's progress. That's at least a functional takeaway rather than say like, it will be good to, to do this. And then next week we say, oh, it'll be good to do this and kind of continue down that path. Um, so I'd very much like to figure out how OGM says, right, you have an idea. This is, this, these are the next steps. Like we've, we agree that this is, this is a good idea. Here's, here's how it progresses. Um, but yeah, basically just echoing kind of Pete's sentiment. Thanks. Um, a couple things. Uh, yesterday, Pete and I were part of a two hour session that Jordan ran for a guy named Yannick Silver, who convenes a group called the One Degree Network, <clears throat> which is well-intentioned people trying to get things done in the world. And Jordan is trying really hard with the community Sea Shepherds. Oh, and Yannick's network is how I met Jordan in the first place, uh, halfway through lockdown. Um, and, and Jordan is trying I, I, really hard. And I, this, this impression was doubled down yesterday just from the process 
to get all the little flotillas of, of, of entities to sort of commit to doing things and being on project plans and all of that. Um, he asked me to participate with an eye toward, hey, um, I could host this for OGM as well. Uh, so I was participating yesterday, partly with the idea of, you know, do we want, uh, do we want OGM to be doing this, uh, et cetera. And, um, and I was ambivalent and I'd like to debrief with Pete kind of in, in this group around that. And I just want to hold that for a second. And then the second thing is back to what Doug put in the room a moment ago, which is, I just want to ask Doug, Doug, what would you like to see us do? Like, what would make you really happy? What, what, what? thing could OGMers do that would make you cavell like, oh, we heard you and we're on it and we're actually doing that. Can you describe it? Well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's so uh, messy in a way. Uh, what I would we like, like messy. We apparently love messy so far. Go ahead. Well, what I would like is a conversation about what the hell's going on in the world and where are we with it? So for example, I think we're at the point where it's clear we are not going to stop temperature rise below three degrees. Uh, given that, what are we gonna spend our time doing? What's worthwhile? And what's our group understanding of that? Uh, is, is that even a reasonable question? I'm open to, to total reframing, but I'd like to be in a dynamic conversation about all those things where we don't quite know where we're going. It's not defined as a project, but it's our common sense of, of what is, uh, to use the language, what the fuck is going on and what do we do about it? So, so um, the pilgrimage project I talked about earlier would involve going and visiting people who are working on exactly those kinds of questions, each of whom has a set, a worldview and a set of opinions. And but possibly... Jerry, let me cut in here. We, yes. don't, we can't even do this with ourselves yet. It's why, a... bring, why go to other people? The, the diversity in this group is extreme, actually. Okay. Um, I'm not sure the diversity in this group is extreme. I know nobody who's a QAnon member or a far right. I, like, there's nobody in this group from the far right. Uh, I bet there are people in this group that think that technology is the solution to, to climate change and people who disagree with that. I totally agree on that. I just don't know that that's a broad, you know, broad, as broad a spectrum as I think many of us wish we had uh, present in the group. Um, so doing this for ourselves would be great. I do this every day in my brain. So I have my own opinions expressed as best I can in the brain, which is this obscure little tool that is still not sort of in the world. And I would love to be doing that conversation with other people, in particular, the other people who have shown up for OGM. And we're not able to do that yet. So yes, yes I'm agreed with that. But okay, but, but the pilgrimage is meant to provoke more of that and draw us into collaborating to, to pin up those kinds of, of suggestions and worldviews and rub them up against each other and figure out how this all works. Um, so we have three people in the queue. Let's go Pete, Michael, Stacy. I think Michael's first. Okay, yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> Hi, and apologies for being late. Uh, no worries. On the pet crisis. Um, I, uh, I'm just, I'm struck as, as we talk with the thought that maybe, maybe a mental exercise, but also to be really practical is if we went around and we, you know, identified the groups who are doing the best work on the stuff that is important to us, perhaps less nascent than some of our, our efforts are, I mean, including factor, I would say, you know, there's probably somebody out there doing what Factor's trying to do better than Factor's doing it. Um, and we ask them what they need from us and what we could help them with. They would 201 probably say money. Um, and you know, our expertise and our wisdom and our ability to help them do what they do pale beside you know, fueling them and perhaps publicizing them. Um, and I, I feel like if OGM as an entity, you know, this gets back to our discussions about is OGM a nonprofit itself? What, what, are, what is our purpose? If we had the thought exercise of, let's say OGM's 
funded to the tune of a endowment of, you know, a billion dollars. And we're out there identifying people who are doing the right work, funding them and connecting them to each other, raising up the ones who may be obscure, but, you know, have, have great stuff to offer. That's, that's to me, I mean, like more, more people doing the same stuff is not really what's being cried out for. It's like powering the people and connecting the people who are doing things. And I don't know if that's a project, you know, for, for us each to um, identify people in, in the sphere we're in or just people we see that we think are doing great work and we wanna connect, but that's a way of being outward oriented and not, you know, navel gazing or, or, you know, collectively navel gazing. I'm sorry to be, that's, that's, you know. Uh, so many navels, so little time. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just really strikes me that, that um, funding is what's needed and direction, um, recognition of direction and how do we do that? Brief response just to you, Michael, which is, I'm desperately trying to shape OGM up into something that people can fund. And the path to that seems to be project oriented pieces that are fundable in the middle of all the stuff we're all trying to do. So defining what a project is and then putting up OKRs and what that, I'm actually trying to head there so that I can go out and appeal to rich people, people who have way too much money uh, and are, have been trying to solve this problem in different ways so that they might help us go, go fund others to do this. So part of this would include a fund for saying, hey, we just located a piece of the puzzle. We'd like to give them some money as well. And we would become kind of a pass through because our filter, our judgment, our antennae in the field turn out to be really pretty good because our worldview or our intentions are, are understandable and are good in that way. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I, I would just say that, you know, I almost think that finding projects that are already in full swing or, or you know, have really proven themselves in a way that our projects can only begin to when we, you know, say, okay, you, you, and you in this group, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, we, we, we could, I, I think it would help us be funded if we said, look, you didn't know about these, you know, 20 projects that we've found in these areas. I mean, let's say we've picked, I mean, this isn't, this isn't our thing, but let's say we picked the, the UN 17 and um, the SDGs and, and said, here are, here's one project in each of these buckets that we have identified as the one that's doing the best work and that we are going to fund if you fund us and we are gonna help and shepherd and connect with other you know, entities. Those, those are our 17 projects, these 17 projects that exist outside of us that are diverse, that are you know, battle tested by the fact that they've been in existence. We're not just dreaming them, they exist. I think that could be really powerful. Um, thank you. Um, Pete and Stacy. Um, thanks. Um, uh, it's an interesting idea, Michael. I, I, I think, well, I think maybe you've got something there, but. <laughs> uh, so on the one hand, Lionsburg and Jordan are hard after the problem of, of getting money and distributing it to the right people. So um, uh, Jerry has a principle uh, I'm going to do this as best as I can do. I, I've seen a need, I'm going to do this until I find that somebody else is doing a better job than me. And then I'm going to join them and do, you know, give them as much power. And, and so Jordan, Jordan and Lionsburg are deep in the let's redistribute money thing. And, and so I, you know, that's why OGM is joining up with Lionsburg in, in that process. So I feel like that, that need is covered and we've got that going as an activity um, and it's much harder than any of us thought <laughs> much 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 harder um, but it's going that project is actually going well um, as as things things are and and 
if you have any energy or passion about doing that, let's get more money to people who are doing a good job or who are capable of doing a good job. Join up with Lionsburg. Just, you know, I, that's, it's an easy, an easy one. Um, uh, so uh, I wanted to honor Doug's, you know, Doug's thing. Um, I think I have that same question, you know, what the F is going on um, and, you know, <laughs> just what the F is going on and all the different places, right? Uh, climate, soil, uh, food systems, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a reasonable discussion to have. I think you could have a, a meta project, maybe I would call that, of, of actually going through and probably each of us can rattle off the top three or four um, amazingly bad things and or amazingly uh, awesome challenges that we have that, that if we can solve them, the world is going to be much better. Um, but we don't do that in a way that uh, I can go to a web page and say, OK, so UN got these 17 SDGs. Here's the 100 or 200 top problems. And here are, um, you know, here are five or 10 different ways that you can sort and rank them and, and understand the scale of them. How many dollars would it take to, you know, this one is, it would only cost $10 billion to do this one, you know, or, you know, uh, you could have a, like a, uh, shopping cart is not quite the right way to do that. Amazon does a good way, a, a good set of, you know, let me look at this data a couple different ways. Trove is even better at that. Um, if we gave, if Vincent was able to accept money to take part of Trove and make it into something where you could see not only who's working on this, but just what are the problems, you know, and Vincent is a wizard at making different ways to visualize that. Um, different ways to think about it, ways to structure those sets of information so that it's easy to pull out lots of pull it out in lots of different ways. That would be an awesome thing. So, so to to honor Doug's, you know, anything that we could do, um, I think that's a good potential project. Um, so I can I can say really clearly for me. The problem that I see is actually a meta problem or a, or a meta meta problem. The problem isn't any one of those problems or the, the super problem is that we have grown into over the past two, three, four hundred years, we have grown into a uh, coexistence, a codependency with super scale um, uh, organizational uh, social structures. We 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 let these cor big corporations and big nation states do incredibly stupid things because most of the time they kind of provide us a better life or what we think of as a better life, right? So, so from a strategic point of view, the the problem that I have chosen it's not climate change, it's not food systems, it's not um, you know whatever, it's not information management, whatever. It's figuring out how we reconstruct the, the whole of society, all, you know, 5 billion people or whatever into much smaller units who, that are human scale that do rational things rather than counter rational things. That for me is the top line problem. Um, and it's easy for me to see it now. It's easy for me to go, uh, does this effort work against, you know, towards that goal or, or is it not helping that goal? tactically so that that goal is is big and large um and there are lots of parts of it that i can't work on but the part that i can work on in a tactical fashion is how do i decentralize knowledge how do i decentralize information how do i get more people talking to each other in groups how do i make groups of groups work right all of that that i can actually do so that's the tactical um, solution set that i have for that big super problem so now to say the conversation of what the F is going on and how bad is it and all of those things, um, it's, it's funny, we're at a point where you can kind of like, like close your eyes, throw a dart and you've hit a problem that you ought to be working on fast as possible or your grandkids are going to be die, dying a horrible death, right? Um, so the one for me that keeps coming up is Klaus and food systems. You know, it's when you listen to Klaus for more than about three minutes, you go, okay, 
uh, Klaus has set a timeline, 30 years, you know, uh, right now we've got 90% of food production and food distribution in the hands of, you know, nine entities, super global entities that don't give a shit about, about humans. Um, and that is going to burn up the planet and cause everybody to, you know, or millions of people, not everybody. Um, it's going to cause millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people to go into major food crisis, uh, which is going to lead to a bunch of other crises, right? It's pretty easy to go, I'm going to drop everything else. I'm not doing this because I have something that I picked, but I actually don't need to do a survey either of, of to say, you know, pick food systems or climate change is another good one, or, you know, the, 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 the one of the year is, um, uh, just dealing with pandemics. And then that breaks into just deal with disinformation and misinformation and the way that people, humans cluster around stupid things rather than clustering around smart things. You know, pick one of those and you're done. You've got your, the rest of your life, you can be working on that super productively. Um, so back to just start doing something, the, there's the heuristic I have kind of is pretty simple. Um, it's, uh, I am super passionate about something and I'm going to do it. Uh, kind of like Jerry says, I'm going to do it until I find somebody doing something better. So I think that's one rule that you can have. There's a thing that I'm passionate about and I'm going to cluster people around me and we're going to get it done. I'm going to work on food systems or I'm going to work on uh, social equity or I'm going to work on, you know, whatever. Pick it, start doing it. If that doesn't call out to you, um, uh, look around you who is doing something and uh, who are the you know who who do you feel resonant with <coughs> you like uh, what they do so um, so the exemplar from for massive wiki for me uh, is Bill Anderson um, Bill likes the idea of massive wiki and stuff like that um, uh, Bill likes uh, you know lots of things uh, as it turns out he and I like working together Bill's like, you know, I don't have a burning need to make Massive Wiki the thing, but it's it's toward the general direction of making the world a better place. And Pete, I really like working with you. You know, we have a lot of fun together. So pick somebody you like working with. So either come up with a thing that you're going to work on and start attracting people like Hack, or look for the people who are looking for help and go, you know, I, I'm kind of ambivalent about, you know, what exactly I'm doing, but I want to um, whatever I'm doing, I want to do it with a bunch of people I really enjoy working with, and I'm going to join up with you and tell me what to do, and I'll get it done. So either either one of those, those are good heuristics. Um, Stacy, then Doug, then me. Well, building off what Pete said, but triggered by Doug and Judy, this is um, is a really small piece that I think is really needs more focus. And Pete, you told a story about Wendy. I don't know the situation, but my question is. Are we looking at the dynamics? How come people don't jump and say, oh, I know how we can make that better. I think that, again, just looking at a small group, just people we know, like Doug said, why aren't people stepping up to say, well, if you do this, like th there's something going on there that's, and it's not just here, it's in the world. And we're not looking at what motivates people to jump on and be part of a project. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is the far right, which is now Q, the Q party, they created jobs and media companies for people to use their creative energy. They created a way for people to do what they want. And that's why I started the meeting with Jerry saying the mission has to be take over the fourth estate, all of us, for the people, <laughs> a real, you know. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Doug? Well, just respond. I think we almost have a conversation here that's interesting to me. Okay. Uh, Pete, <coughs> uh, Pete's assertion that decentralization is the path opens a question for me. How with decentralization can you take on the oil companies and global issues? It just doesn't seem to me that it scales. So my conclusion is we need radical decentralization and a, a new kind of uh, integration at the same time. Um, 
So let me, I've got a bunch of things built up in my queue here, um, and then I'll pass back to Pete. So, um, so I'm really frustrated partly because I put a couple of links here, promising solutions to world crises, planetary crises, et cetera. Doug, I've been actually curating the questions you're addressing actively every day, all the time. When I hit a great article, I put it in the right place. I have questions about like, I have big questions, big world questions. Uh, your question about, hey, if we try to replace appliances, that's never going to work. Uh, I would love to rub that against uh, Saul Griffith or somebody else who says, nope, we just have to electrify everything and don't worry about it. Here's how we solve that. There, there's been a really great conversation on one of the too many lists I'm on lately about batteries and how recyclable batteries are. And it turns out they're insanely recyclable. Like if you just get old batteries back, you can, it, it's like, a, it's like a gold mine, but you don't have to go break a mountain apart. You just dig through the batteries and you've got raw materials. And it turns out that new battery technology needs less cobalt than the original. Anyway, all those things are little fixes to all the different parts of the puzzle. And I'm, I'm frustrated because a lot of that stuff is trapped inside people's heads like yours, Doug. And you've got a manuscript out, which is a book form. The book form seems to be the way that most people are thinking. And I'm like, the book is too long, too big. It's not nuggetized. It's not, it doesn't actually work in conversation. Well, I don't have time to read through the queue of things that I, I have open tabs I can't make my way through in a day. Partly because what I do when I hit a tab, when I hit something that's well done, is I deconstruct it and connect it up to everything else I've seen before in my little weird, weird web in proprietary software that is not free yet out in the world. And I'm like incredibly frustrated that other people aren't working similarly in whatever tool strikes their fancy. I don't care. And sharing out a consistent larger scale web of where the fuck are we and what matters and how are we going about solving it? And so I'm really frustrated by that because I really want to be doing that day to day. And so I want to say, how do we get others to join in, pr in producing some pieces of those artifacts? And that might mean that there's only six people on earth who like doing it, but if they form a squad and go and, and, and like swarm different kinds of projects and debrief and construct it and build this Indra's net between us, that even that is very useful. And how do we turn this into a process, not just a series of projects? So. I'm trying to figure out how OGM can like, like Sherman's March to the Sea, a terrible analogy, but leave a swath of OGM activity and leave behind a trail of people going, oh, we should think and do work like this. And we should start using project plans and put them into the same web of projects so that people can find out what we care about and where we are, and then just keep going versus us sitting here and deciding, and, and Pete, I, I hit this when you and I were trying to make a, you know, using your everything as a project thing, um, and I'm trying to find a middle ground here. Suddenly I saw an infinite unfolding recursive set of project plans because to do this project plan, we needed another project plan, which was then, and I could see all of my time accounted for for the next decade. And I couldn't see my way through getting all those things done. So I'm trying to figure out how to be like a ninja in the field, just doing the connecting and the interviewing and whatever, and stimulating all of us to work toward this vision of solving all the little puzzle pieces hey, somebody else is doing this better. Let's adopt that and bring it into the middle. And now we've solved that piece of it. And now we're doing that much better than we used to, whether that's uh, taking a video and turning it into really useful uh, post-production you know, materials, which there's now enough AI in the world to do a beautiful job of that. Well, why don't we do that? That sounds great. Uh, so that then as we connect up the Indra's net, uh, any one of the nodes can go back to the best conversations that happened around that particular node, for example, right? And, and that little snippet out of 15 different calls is all connected up and you can go, oh, and everybody can come up to speed really quickly on it, et cetera. So that's basically like where I'm thrashing on all this. It's like, I see this possibility and I just want us to get to work building it. And I, I keep getting sort of stuck on sandbars along the way. So Pete, then Judy. Uh, you're muted. I clicked the wrong button. I think Judy should go first. Okay, Judy, then Pete. Uh, I think that one of the great challenges that we're dealing with is, I mean, we're a group of intellectuals sitting around trying to figure out how we can engage larger communities of people to think about it. And the vast majority of people have a narrow attention span, a shorter time track, and they're not interested in integrating a lot of new information. So it almost gets down to sloganism or, or, or bites because most of the people, and I, I'll use kind of the E.E. E. Cummings most people term from his poetry, um, 
because I don't mean it necessarily pejoratively, it's just different. And there's a cluster of these people whose views and values and behaviors are very different than mine. And I think that most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the big issues. They're busy trying to put food on the table, keep their kids clothed, make sure the kids don't turn into delinquents and all sorts of other pragmatics of living. And so it needs to be very relevant to their day-to-day -day things for them to care enough to even begin to listen or think about something. You know, if you go to them and say, I think I have an idea that would make kindergarten better for your kid. Do you think your kid's teacher would like it? They'll probably listen and they'll actually talk to you. But if you talk education in a bigger window, they tune out instantly. And so somehow we need to get a lot more granular or we need to find mechanisms to engage individuals who like cracking new eggs, <laughs> you know, and bringing ideas to different groups of people. It has to be kind of grassrootsy rather than elevated. And I, I don't know exactly how to do that. I've never been political, <laughs> um, but I'm starting to think I need to be because maybe I can just be the camel's nose in the tent. If I plant a seed here and somebody likes it, they'll go run with it and I can plant the seed somewhere else and another group will run with it and then I can hook the two groups up. Um, so I'm kind of running personal social experiments right now, um, trying to determine what might work. And people don't read. I mean, that's part of the problem. So even if it's in the brain, a lot of people don't really read and they don't have the attention, this sounds awful, but they're not interested in or intrigued by following the path of divergent logic and sorting out what's closer to reality. I think there are certain types of people who are, but I don't find that in my neighbors necessarily. Um, I find it in mm -hmm. fact people that I know at the universities, people who are on average more highly educated than the general public of the country. And I'm not sure that it's accurate to say that those highly educated people are the ones that can really influence change because a lot of times they're pretty socially disengaged from change processes. So I don't mean to sound cynical, but I'm, I'm really struggling personally with how to have impact to invite the engagement that is needed to actually create any meaningful impact. Thanks, Judith. I love that. Um, Pete, then Michael, then me. It's funny, I, I've said something similar, Judy. Um, people don't read. Um, people, another th another one is people don't watch videos because I don't watch, I, I can't watch a YouTube video. It's really hard <laughs> for me. Um, unless it's about uh, music theory, actually. Um, uh, people don't wiki. Um, people don't take notes. Uh, people don't make project plans. Um, the thing that people do do is um, people socialize, people chat, and people uh, like to talk about their interests and people, and, and chat happens in different places, right? Sometimes it's a Zoom room, sometimes it's phone calls, sometimes it's Telegram, sometimes it's Mattermost, sometimes, sometimes it's, email. it's a pub. <laughs> um, so the one of the lessons, and, and people will read voraciously or watch watch a YouTube video voraciously if it's if it's something that they need in their life, right? Um, so uh, so the, the thing to do is to figure out where people are are chatting um, and and start talking about your passions uh, where people are chatting when you're chatting with them. Um, and that's that's the way you end up making connections. Um, so uh, and and Stacy had some good questions. Uh, my I have two observations. The thing that people are attracted to is activity. Um, so if you're doing something, if you're doing a thing, there are going to be people who say, um, oh, can I help you do that thing? Whatever it is, right? Um, uh, so uh, so the, the lesson then is start doing a thing and telling people about it and you'll start attracting people uh, who follow you and help you. Um, or you won't and you'll get the, you know, that's the universe feeding back to you that you're doing the wrong thing or, or you, you're you embarrassed when you talk about it or you haven't figured out how to talk about it in a way that, that's interesting to anybody. Um, I don't see those things happening very much. If you're doing something, when whatever you're doing, you get people reacting to you and you get people saying, can I help you? Uh, so the 
it comes back to just start doing something. Um, so now I can also make the observation that when you start, just start doing something, when you figure out something that you should be doing, it's scary as heck. It's confusing it as heck. Something that is a little bit different that you're passionate about um, and that you think is the answer, um, it's, it doesn't, by definition, it doesn't fit into anybody else's bucket. And so you're trained both both from human nature um just you know just because we're um animals and primates and stuff like that just by human nature it goes against the grain to to say i want to do a thing that's a little bit new and a little bit different it doesn't you know your brain even doesn't want to parse it it's like yeah i don't think you're that that doesn't make sense why don't you go you know do the thing that everybody else is doing and then our culture is even worse right it, it trains you that there's important things and not important things and that probably if you've come up with a new idea it's a not important thing so you have to fight really hard and meditate and do all, kind, all kinds of crazy stuff just to be able to focus long enough and say this is really i i can feel this this is my intuition saying this is a right thing to do and by golly i'm going to start doing it and I don't know how to even express what it is that I'm doing, but I'm, you have to convince yourself that you're going to start, that you're going to start doing it. And it's super scary and it's confusing. And I've learned over the course of a few decades doing new startup-y kinds of things. It's when the, the feeling of confusion and frustration and disappointment in yourself for thinking about crazy things and all of that, that's when you know that you're you've got something important and you need to keep digging at it. Why do I think that's important? How can I explain that to somebody else? What are the, you know, who's the first person I can talk to and say, you know, I have this idea and I think it's crazy, but what do you think? And take their information and, and you know, start building a thing that, that keeps making sense and keeps making sense. Um, it's really hard work. Um, and it's, you know, obvious, uh, arguably the most important thing that you can do is to come up with a new idea that nobody else has really thought of and stick to it and start doing it and start executing it and, and starting to tell other people what you think it is. And when they tell you what they think it is, continue to feed that into your vision and make it bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. So it's really hard work. Um, it's it it and it doesn't feel rewarding uh, for a long time. It feels like you're beating your head against the wall, or you're doing something stupid or, or wrong. But you have to keep doing that long enough to to get over the fact that to get over the friction, the startup friction of of doing a new thing. And that okay. that's how you that's how you do it. I think what you just said, Pitt, is really really important. Um, and we should all kind of take a moment and pause and think about what we're doing that's congruent with that. It's sort of walking the talk and then letting other people notice that you're doing something different and not pushing it on them, but inviting them to make it better or whatever that, that creates a movement. Because I've worked a lot on what historically would have been called change management and you actually can't manage change. You can invite change. <laughs> you can model change. There's a bunch of other words, but you can't manage change <laughs> because it's too inwardly driven. So I think uh, you're being very wise, Pete. Thank you. And I like Judy's instinct here to pause for a second and just reflect on it. We don't slow our conversations down very much very often, which Pete had mentioned earlier as well. And I operate under the self-delusion that I'm doing what Pete just described. That, that like the words that just came out of your mouth Pete, felt like very, very much like what the journey I'm on and what I'm trying to do. And that's my, my own perception about what I'm trying to do. And I'm not sure that that matches up with anybody else's perception from outside. So why don't we just sit for a second with, uh, with, that, with uh, what Pete put on the table.
um, Michael than me? I apologize for breaking our moment of silence, but I actually <clears throat> have to have to leave for another meeting. Um, but did want to say in in listening to Pete what you said and 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 thinking about you know the way activity attracts, um, I just want to add that um, measurable results attract. And, and, and Judy, what you were saying about, I have an idea that will help your kindergarten teacher teach better. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about there's, um, I'm in a group that's discussing ways that we think all kindergarten teachers could teach better is less effective than what you said, but even more effective is, you know, Here's a kinder, kin, kindergartner teacher over here who's using this method and getting these measurable results. Um, you know, maybe maybe you should pattern. You, you should help your teacher pattern their lessons after that. Um, and then here are finding two teachers who are getting results. Um, in slightly different ways, connecting them and seeing if one, one plus one can be more than two. Um, I mean, it, it does circle back to my, you know, kind of looking outward um, and, and supporting people who are already getting results doing things. Um, but, you know, I, I just was struck by, by yes, activity attracts and um, results you know, attract even more. Um, not, not to say that we shouldn't do things and we shouldn't be active, but, but recognition of others' success in being active should be attractive to us. Um, and with that, I'm afraid. That's all right. Thanks story. for being here. We're, run, we're running over our call time Thanks. as it is by a lot. So, wow. um, bye, Michael. So I'll, let me jump in briefly and then uh, to Stacy. Um, and I'll put my notes in the in this thing. So I, I just realized I had four really great conversations over the long weekend, one of which was with a relative uh, who was described to me as bipolar and has kind of stepped out of things and has some health issues and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that he used to teach communications at Fresno State and the, the rabbit holes he was chasing for his own personal satisfaction were insanely useful for OGM. One of the people he, he introduced me to was the thinker, uh, Walter, Fisher, who created this thing called the narrative paradigm that basically says that narratives or stories, everything boils down to narratives and only narratives carry like public opinion, change people's minds, whatever else, which is a, like a wholesale theory, but, but uh, comes back to like our emphasis on storytelling and memes and other sorts of things like, like, and, and again, I think we have to work a little bit everywhere at once because we have to work on the big picture and what we think is broken and the large scale ideas, but we also have to talk to individual humans who are doing stuff. And when we find something that's high functioning, replicate it, make it available, put it into the pattern languages that we're developing. One of the, one of the things is like, how do we identify high functioning people, entities, processes, and put them in places where they're easier to pick up and implement and, and, and adapt and appropriate by anybody else. And if we can lather, rinse, repeat on that cycle at whatever scales, we're doing good work. I think that that's important work that, that we can sort of do. Um, and then um, uh, such an important piece of this is simple human connections. And one of the things we do pretty well is, is build community of practice and just build community so that we can see who else is in the room, but there's a lot more there. Um, one of my goals is to make something that's, that gives brain-like results, but is one step more complicated than Instagram because there's millions of people apparently perfectly capable of posting endlessly to Instagram, Pinterest, name, you know, name your, your dozen tools and add hashtags in a very sophisticated way, which is a, a metadata, which I love. So can we, can we do something that's that simple, but only one step more that then takes us into weaving the, the collective fabric Right, and I don't. I, I think that that's a really interesting challenge, and, and a, a, it's a it's a user interface challenge. It's a whatever we can we can sort of put it out there. I will say that people are reading and doing stuff like like 
people are surprisingly sort of anal about stuff. And, and like in QAnon, the phrase is, I did the research, which means they followed a rabbit hole of really long videos and listening to tedious people with completely bogus ideas, building on top of false data, but they actually spent a bunch of time doing the research and they are convinced from all this media that was generated sort of in, a, in this alternate reality game called QAnon, that was media was actually generated. And Stacey, you point out really nicely that people are being paid, they're making a living feeding this alternate reality game that is taking you know, democracy and society down, down the tubes. So, so anyway, um, and then uh, like the, the number of humans watching videos and the number of hours of video being consumed all the time is unbelievably high. So Pete, I know that you have a, a dislike for, like, it's like Marc Antoine, he wants, he wants text and a command line and he'll be like happier if the whole world goes back to like in the beginning was the command line. Uh, but the general world is like all over this stuff and, and just eating it up like crazy. Um, hey, um, just we had a discussion in chat about video. So the videos I watch are the ones that I'm passionate about. I now watch video. I love watching videos, but I have to be passionate. I have to be learning something. And I also realize the videos I watch are edited so that all the time it's worthwhile rather You're than looking for high quality. it's a little worthwhile yeah well you know a, an ogm call is high quality but uh you know it's got a lot of discussion and then some amazing points and a lot of discussion and some amazing points so i'm not going to watch that you know cool um stacy then judy uh, is it a short thing judy it is a short thing but go ahead stacy thanks I i'll be short too i won't address everything um oh Having to, Judy mentioned earlier, these are academics here, and then Pete, you said, you, you know, what you just said about getting a project going. I just want to point out that all those people that were part of like the Q thing, those are people that might have given up your approach. And so they will just fill in the void. They became active in a movement just talking to people, no work involved. And I'm interested in you know, dealing with that. Go I'll ahead, Judy. Yeah, me too, very much. Thanks, Stacey, go ahead, well, Judy. I was just going to suggest that, that one of the things that's most, that I have found most effective is engaging in meaningful dialogue, is saying, I have the nugget of an idea, but I need feedback and I need input to help shape the idea. And then genuine listening to the other person's perspective. If you ask for help, not very many people will just say outright, I'm too busy to help with anything. And it's the most genuine way I have found to engage people in thinking about any dimension of what's occurring or what might need to change in what's occurring. And so uh, it works pretty well in small groups or even groups of 20. I don't know exactly how you do that in groups of hundreds or thousands, um, but I just wanted to put that nugget out there for thinking about because it's it really if you want change in people and and, and you know in yourself that you're not going to change easily without some kind of dialogue that causes you to think that gee I'm missing something here <laughs> I need to really think about this because maybe I've been looking at it wrong um, that's a social practice that is important as well and it might mean something in terms of how we would want to engage people in the topics that we wish them to think about. Um, yes, and, and one of the things that comes up for me here is like, how do we slow down the conversations in some sense? I mean, it, it, I've got these contradictory impulses. On the one hand, I don't have time to listen to hour and a half conversations from lots of different people which are being posted like if, with wild abandon on places like YouTube, which I'm guilty of all the time. Um, and I wish there was an auto, auto summarizer or a place that, that goes straight into the places where I, I want to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, on the other hand, I think that I often wind up trapped in, I'm trying to sort of do the brain curation while hosting, while managing, and it, some ability to put us all into bullet time where we're like, buh, 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 and then hit pause. So one thing I did with a couple of really conservative people I had text conversations with uh, over the last, over lockdown actually, uh, sort of into the election cycle uh, and before I think, 
was I deconstructed the, one of a couple of them sent me like a several paragraphs of uh, full, full, full of statements of, of stuff. And so I deconstructed them and I put them in my brain. I basically took took each sentence and made a thought and then connected them to the arguments. And then I went back to these people and said, hey, I took you seriously. Like what you wrote, I just I just put it in like like this this tool I have. Would you like to sort of talk about it in a deeper fashion? And both of them bailed and said, no, thanks. Don't, not interested or don't have time or whatever. Like they, they went away. But my, my gesture was both, I'm really interested in what you're saying and I wanna, I wanna understand it. And if we peel it apart and complexify it a little bit, we might understand each other better, et cetera. It was, it was an attempt to open that door. And when those attempts failed, but I think that that's an important thing to try to do. Um, and so in, in modeling, you know, all, all perspectives into the conversation. Um, Anyway, and then uh, Pete, I really wanted to debrief a little bit, maybe separately for now, because we're almost on two hours here uh, about yesterday's uh, uh, call, because one of the things I, I thought was like, I don't know how we're supposed to solve this in two, in two hours and get people committed onto projects and all that. It, like, you know, one of the things on, on the table was we should all just harmonize our, our worldview first. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah, that that that's just not going to happen. How do we get a good enough agreement on like roughly where we're headed to then work on stuff? I, I, I could get there. But man, the idea that we're going to harmonize a worldview first uh, that isn't it's so white or, or, that, or that isn't so high level and whitewashed as to be meaningless for the project. Like we're going to bet we're going to make life better for all of humanity. That is awesome. Me, too. I really don't know what that means in terms of how you think it's going to be implemented or how I do, right? And, and that, didn't, that didn't turn up any interesting information for me about, about how to move forward. So, so I'm interested. In, and Jordan has offered to do that for us. And I'm, I'm, I'm very mixed because on the one hand, we totally need something that will catalyze us into people raising their hand and saying, I have a project who'd like to play here, right? Which is what you're asking for, Pete. But I'd love to see as well. Uh, and we don't, we're still building the mirror where we can see what a project is and who's got projects and all that. Go ahead, Judy. I was just going to say, depending on when you have that call and if, if it would be of use to you as well as me, I'd be interested to participate because I feel really badly that I wasn't able to be on the call yesterday to just see what was happening. So listening no to a debrief and thinking about it would be good. Cool. Thanks, Judy. We'll do that. Um, I have a feeling we should probably wrap our call at this point. Any <laughs> We're pretty far and, over the normal time already. <laughs> we are. And Pete and I had scheduled a different conversation for this hour, which we didn't publicize at all. So we're going to postpone it. But it was about uh, the question he raised during the, the MOU process, which was, hey, um, what uh, a fact basically answering frequently asked questions about what does it mean to be affiliated with OGM? Like, what are my responsibilities? What are my duties? What, what are liabilities am I exposed to? All those kinds of questions. And this is stuff that we need to actually address. So Pete and I will rebook that call and broadcast it better. Okay. Um, and so the, the decentralization thing, which Pete just put in the chat is really interesting. And I think means different things to different people. Like decentralization is one of those rich words like democracy that, and trust that, that like, hey, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it means. And I'm wondering how to how to harness that exploration, right? Um, how, do we, how do we understand better what we mean by decentralization, what the options are, who's doing a great job of it, all of that. Um, and I think there's many different ways to skin that cat. I don't know why anybody invented that analogy or that, that, <laughs> that, that, that idiom. And are there many ways to skin a cat? I mean, like, not, not being sure. a tanner. You can I, start in any part of the, the anatomy. Not being a tanner, I don't know. Is that the thought you will really want to leave us with? No, no, no. I'd like something more, uh, something closer to puppies and kittens. Oh, wait, there's the cat again. Um, any last thoughts? Um, uh, Doug, I just maybe this is the last thought. I would love to find a way to liberate your thoughts from the book format. And, 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 and I, at one of, there's like millions of students out there, young humans trying to learn and trying to become literate in media and do whatever else. There's also a whole bunch of people with really interesting ideas out there. <clears throat> Some of which are way out there and cockamamie, but all of which could use deconstruction, reassembly, manifestation in other forms of, of media, visualization, storytelling, meme making, I don't know what, 
Um, but is there a way to, 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 to swarm this need and to invent in the process the thing that obsoletes the book and the movie and the documentary and the long form video? I don't know. Uh, and still, it's, it doesn't kill off the book and the long form video, but enriches them somehow. Go ahead, Pete. Um, <clears throat> it's a really good question. I think that, that the answer is similar with your um, brain, Jerry, by the way. Um, so you curate a lot into the brain, um, but it's kind of a, a one-way journey, right? So the the answer is that books and brains. This this goes back to the people don't read thing. Um, people learn people learn and do by conversations. So um, when and and actually taking a book or or the brain and turning it into even better or even smaller or even more diverse kinds of media doesn't solve the problem. Um, or it only solves the problem for the people who did the conversion of that, basically. Um, and then maybe a little bit for other people, you know, if they, they could see a, a snippet of Doug's book on Twitter and go, wow, that resonates with me, maybe that would lead them to read, you know, three more tweets and maybe that would read them, make, get them to read a page or a, par a paragraph or, or a, a chapter or something like that. But in the main, we who are authors and curators think that the answer to things is better authorship and better curation, right? The answer is more conversations. Um, so what you really need is somebody taking a book and saying, um, and maybe even just this chapter of this book is really important to me. Um, the rest of it is interesting, but I don't really care about it. This chapter is really interesting to me. I want to talk about it with somebody. That's when you get, you know, can you help me digest this book? Can you, can I teach the material from this book to you in conversation, right? It's all about conversations. The way that, that people work, the way that muggles, the way that muggles work with information is by conversation and activity. And those of us who are authors and editors and publishers and knowledge managers forget that because we think, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I love this thing that I've condensed into a thousand pages or condensed into a hundred thousand nodes. Nobody cares, <laughs> you know, uh, the people who, or, or the, the people, muggles care when it is conversation and action about stuff that is relevant to their lives. And so I agree with everything you just said, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping to create artifacts that enrich those many conversations and that you should you should hope to make conversations that need lots of little artifacts. I'm not sure that's a different thing. <laughs> no, uh, I, yeah. I think it is actually because it's it's an invitation to improve something by participation. So so around the world trying to recover reefs people sink old ships. And that old ship becomes armature for a new reef and, and like gritters come and glom onto it and fish swim through the portholes and hey, new reef. Um, I'm seeing this Indra's net that, that we're building. That creates a capability, but not the activity, right? Yeah. It's the fish who come and live there. Exactly. That is, is the deal. Right, totally agree. Um, Stacy, mm -hmm. then Doug, and then we're out of the call. One more thing, and I promise I won't bring this up again, but I just want for a minute for you to think about um, phenomena of like American Idol, where millions of people around the world want this chance to shine. And you take something like that and you invite young people to come and do what you said about Doug's book, to come and break apart Doug's book and create their own videos competing with each other because they want to be the best to create that version. And yes. that's the way to energize people. And that's what I I'm trying to put out there. And Pete, the problem is I don't want to do this project alone. I, I want to throw out the idea and I want to be a part of it. That's it. That's all. And then I want to go deal with the muggles. So that's, uh, so I think when I'm talking about stuff, I'm talking about what you just described as well. Like you're, what you just said, Cece, it's exactly into what I think I would like to help us stand up so that everybody is swarming all these different ideas, creating artifacts by the bazillions tagging them up and linking them up a little bit a few people are like cleaner fish going through this whole thing saying oh this connects over here and here's a puzzle part and you all should talk you know because a lot of this is social it's not it's not uh, intellectual and so forth anyway i, I love it love that um doug you have the last word for this call well uh, 
Uh, there are two groups I'm actively involved with where we do have a conversation. One is economists that are stuck on thinking that the market and technology will solve our problems. And the other is a group on reinventing government who think that if you get the government process right, the problems are solved without ever having to specify what the problems are they're trying to work on. So for me, I'm pushed by both of those to want to have a meta conversation about what more deeply is going on and can we shift our strategy. Now notice in both of those, the book plays almost no part at all, except for me personally, which is a fine place for it to be. Uh, and I'm, with both of those group, groups, I'm able to move them towards a conversation that was broader than they expected but it's not yet at the level of uh, what I think we can say about the darker forces going on in society. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. And I, and thought, like to, I thought you had the last word, Doug, but apparently Judy does. Well, just an, a notion that we've said many times that people become engaged because they, of a sense of belonging. And I think that's the problem with knowledge and books and other content is you're not connecting to another person. You don't feel like you belong. And so what Doug is talking about, I think it's, it's very different to have a conversation with a person than to sit alone and read a book. And I think that that's the factor that we're dealing with in the reaching of many people. And so I don't know how to fix it, but I think that yeah. relational piece is a really critical piece. And it's more about the relationship than the, than the content at the beginning. Then the relationship shapes the shared content. But there are some books that are all about membership. So if I say my favorite book is Atlas Shrugged, there's a club. If I say my favorite book is the Bible, there's a club. And I can, you know, Silent Spring, what have you. There's, there's like a bunch of milestone books that represent a community and a way of thinking and are sort of iconic where ha almost having read the book is, is membership uh, process, like ritual to, to sort of be in the club. Although I would probably say many people who love these works have never actually read the full book, but, but the books represent the community in some sense. So, so there's a, there's, the books are artifacts that, 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 you know, Karl Popper and his thinking, there's like a lot of these kinds of things. Um, and I think Doug hits these all the time in his conversations because he's talking to communities whose works are represented by a canonic series of different books that are world that include worldviews and how we how we solve these problems. And, and one of the world's problems right now is that we're busy laboring under this, you know, rugged individualist, neoconservative, globalized, consumer capitalist worldview that is supported by a whole bunch uh, of, of intellectual works. Um, Pete, do you want to describe what you just put in the chat and then we'll be done? Uh, no, another okay. time. Okay. Um, thank you all for a really generative conversation. Uh, alas, yet another conversation, but I think we put in front of ourselves a lot of um, things we'd like to get done that will take us out of the space of mere conversation. So with that. Have a great day, thank everybody. Aloha. <laughs>